tonight. As we gather this evening, I am aware of how much human need we have witnessed in the last two months. We have seen lives devastated by Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria. And we have felt the pain of unspeakable tragedies in Las Vegas and so many other places around the world. Perhaps less obvious to us are the human needs right next door. A friend you see in the grocery store, your child's best friend's mother, the man who faithfully attends the high school football games, the transgendered youth trying to make his way in an uncertain world. Yes, right next door, the need for safety, support, and care for those entangled in abusive partnerships or who are facing unrelenting bullying. And yet, you know the truth of these needs in our very own communities or you wouldn't be here tonight. This past year, Women's Support Services supported 877 clients, 517 of whom were new. Of the new clients, 71 were children. We responded to 450 crisis hotline calls, and we worked hard to prevent those calls from even needing to be made by conducting 142 workshops, prevention workshops for children and teens in local schools, in daycare programs, and in camps. But we still have a long way to go. Uh, West has an amazing staff, all of whom are committed to the work they do, and you can recognize them by the purple name tags that they're all wearing. Uh, and I can point over there to some of them. You'll find them around in the crowd. Please thank them for the work that they do. And if you have any questions or if you have any concerns, please don't hesitate to approach any one of us. Yes, I can tell you that West has an amazing staff and I am proud to work with each one of them. However, we also know that we could not do this work without all of you. Only a community of compassionate, committed people can transform lives for the better. We cannot simply stand by and allow our friends and neighbors in need to remain isolated and alone. Our commitment must be as active bystanders, standing with those who need our support and care. And Wes has the resources to help each one of you be an active bystander. First and foremost, be a friend and don't give up on someone who is struggling. Abusers depend upon their victims being friendless and they often orchestrate it. Remind those in need that help is available. Quietly give them our hotline number. Refer them to one of our counselors. Let them know about our safety, healing, and peer empowerment support group that meets regularly on Tuesdays. For youth in the LGBTQI community, we have a new empowerment group starting on Sunday afternoons. We have a lot of information on the table behind us so that you can learn about these resources and these opportunities. The resources to help are here. And I include each one of you as a vital resource and treasured partner in helping to end domestic violence and abuse through intervention, prevention, and education. Tonight, we remember 13 Connecticut residents who lost their lives to intimate partner violence. Tonight, we stand up and say, no more. Tonight, we stand together to recommit ourselves to ending domestic violence. Tonight, we bear witness and make our pledge. Thank you so much for your presence and your support. I am now pleased to introduce to you Curtis Rand, Salisbury First Selectman. Curtis, thank you for being with us. Good evening. Um, bear with me. This font is pretty small. Um, this was approved last night by the uh, unanimous vote of the Board of Selectmen. Um, I'll just read it through. Whereas domestic violence in Connecticut is intolerable, unacceptable, must be stopped, and deserves considerable public attention, 
And whereas children who witness domestic violence often grow up believing that physical cruelty in relationships is acceptable behavior and thus tend to perpetuate a cycle of violence in society. And whereas many state and local programs addressing the domestic violence program problem have achieved success, bringing greater safety to families. And whereas community leaders, police, judges, advocates, healthcare workers, and concerned citizens in Connecticut are working together to develop solutions to this serious problem and to implement services that will improve our responses when it occurs. And whereas programs designed to educate men and women about ways they can help prevent domestic violence are being developed across our state. And whereas numerous law enforcement officials and departments have created specialized domestic violence units that cooperate with community advocates to enhance services for victims and representatives from the faith community frequently provide essential support in areas where there may be no other services available. And whereas anyone can be a victim of domestic violence, regardless of age, sex, ethnicity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic status, or religion. And whereas we must continue to hold domestic abusers accountable, punish them to the full extent of the law, and prevent them from inflicting more abuse, now therefore be it resolved that we, the Board of Selectmen of Salisbury, do hereby proclaim October 2017 as Domestic Violence Awareness Month in Salisbury and call upon our citizens to recognize this important event. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'm Reverend Mickey Nunmiller from the United Church of Christ in Cornwall, and uh, I'm a former uh, president of the West Board, and I remain very committed to the work of this fine organization. As we gather in this beautiful space this evening, we're, I think, very aware, as Betsy said, of the effects of violence around us, uh, especially since Sunday, and uh, not just domestic violence, but I think it's very important as we gather that we um, surround ourselves with everything right now in this place that is good and that is pure and hopeful and peaceful as we prepare our minds and hearts to remember those who have lost their lives this year to domestic violence in the state of Connecticut. So let us open ourselves, though it may be painful, uh, to share compassion in this time of remembrance. Thank you very much. Good evening. I'm Rebecca Cohen Lillard, and I would just like to invite Lila Wood up to the stand. She's going to do our remarks for this this evening's vigil, and um, she's one of our mission supporters. Thank you, you're um, It may seem like I have a lot here to say, but actually, unlike Curtis, whose font was small, I've put mine on the giant side, Curtis, <laughs> to help with aging eyes. I am really honored to speak before you tonight. Women's Support Service has done much work to draw attention to the need for protection of all our citizens here in, Northwest, in the northwest corner of Connecticut. When I first became associated with Wes, the volunteers met in a building beside Sharon Hospital. There was room in the back for us. At that time, everyone involved with Wes was a volunteer. I was a hotline volunteer. I received my training in that back room and went on to do counseling in the back room when needed. Now this organization has a great building of its own in Sharon and a full staff of employees who can respond to the different needs of our individuals in our communities. Wes has always had a strong response to the people they serve by providing counseling emergency shelter, family support, and advocacy at court. 
This organization has grown to be proactive through its work, especially with children. It has developed a strong working partnership with schools in their service area and those schools in the adjacent New York State communities. Currently, I work with Rebecca Cohen Lillard, Community Educator and Outreach Coordinator for WES. Rebecca does outreach and prevention at the North Canaan Elementary School, where I've been the school counselor for 30 years. Rebecca and I have worked together for six years to bring programs that help children choose thoughtful responses to the stresses in their lives. The goal is to teach children through active learning that violence is not the answer to life's stressors. Violence and abuse, unfortunately, is experienced by all people either directly or indirectly at some time in their lives. Certainly, our children need to be ready with healthy responses to their own stress. But also, it is critical that they learn and are aware that they can have a positive effect on others' actions as active bystanders. Educating children on supportive actions to help others will allow all of us to build better communities. As an, an active bystander is you, all of you who are here tonight drawing attention to a problem that used to be only whispered about behind closed doors. You and people like you have made it possible for people experiencing domestic violence to get the help and support they so desperately need. The money that has been donated and raised by caring individuals like you has given birth to a most powerful force, the force of education. Our young people are becoming aware through education that they can make a change by being active bystanders and not just passive observers. They become empowered to do the right thing because of organizations like Women's Support Services and individuals like you. I thank you all and thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak and I hope all of us will continue to be active bystanders. And now I'd like to introduce another mission supporter who's going to read a poem that she wrote, Desiree. Good evening, everybody. This piece is titled Impact. And I probably don't need the mic. <laughs> I've heard the question, what's wrong with you, posed to me more often than the question, what's happened to you? See, the implication of those questions vary greatly. What's wrong with me implies blame or guilt versus what's happened to you implies maybe that the fault is not my own and perhaps maybe somewhere down the line I've been wronged. If I were bleeding from an open wound, even a minor one, there'd be stitches and band-aids, doctors and nurses available somewhere to treat the affected area. I'd most likely get the initial care and follow-up care that I needed. I'd probably not have to suffer from that wound alone or in silence. Help would be available to me somewhere with minimal to no shame. I'd be made to feel comfortable to share how that wound came to be. But what if I were bleeding from my heart due to emotional or mental scars, those invisible to the naked eye, those you could choose not to acknowledge? Would those same doctors and nurses be readily available to assist me? non-judgmentally with minimal to no shame or would I be forced to deal with those invisible wounds in silence, in isolation, in despair, forced to feel shame and guilt? Allow me just briefly to take you on a journey, a journey into my setbacks and comebacks. Trauma and I had a relationship long before I knew how to define trauma or relationships. We go back like four flats on a Cadillac Trauma was like red flags I never looked for or looked past. I often thought the things that had happened to me were some way, somehow my fault. And if only I had been better, if only I had been more understanding or more compassionate, 
If only I had loved harder or spoke a little less, things would have all turned out differently. I internalized everything for so long, always placing the blame on me, not where it truly belonged. I found myself becoming a member of groups I'd never thought I'd have to associate myself with because bad things were to happen to bad people, not to me and not to us. I found myself often arguing with myself that I was not a victim, but I knew I was not a perpetrator. I knew when I said no, he was to stop. I knew if he continued the behavior, I had been wronged. I knew when he raised his voice to me for no reason, I was not to blame. I knew when I said I don't want you to use my car after he asked a hundred times that I had the right to utter those words. I knew having objects thrown in my direction was not okay, no matter what I may have said or may have done. I knew when I refused to allow him to go through my phone and he did so anyway, I had the right to be mad. I knew when I called the police I needed help. I knew when I called the police, though the environment in which I came up said we don't call the police for any reason unless someone is dead in the street, that I didn't care what my environment said. I wanted to live and as I heard the air come out of my tires that faithful day, I didn't want that air to come out of me also. I knew I needed help, help to get away from the one I said I love, from the one with whom I shared I do, from the one who said he loved me too. There are things I've always said that love doesn't do. Love is not abusive or possessive. Love is not demanding or insensitive or often insecure. Love is truly compassionate. It is pure, it is kind, it is patient, and sometimes love has to endure. I realized just before my 30th birthday that it was okay to belong to groups that I had never wanted to. It's okay to be a victim and to have been victimized. It's okay to be a survivor a proud survivor, one who is strong, one who is powerful, one who is beautiful, one who has endured, one who can overcome and surpass anything. And it's okay to belong to groups that I never wanted to because I'm not alone in this fight, in this race, in this journey. It's okay to say I've tried things that didn't work, but it's never okay to say I've been abused in any manner for any reason. For every one of me that stands before an audience to share, there are countless others whose voices have been silenced forever. For every one of me that stands before you, there are others who have lost this precious fight. If I were bleeding from an open wound, even a self-inflicted one, there'd be doctors and nurses available somewhere to treat the affected area with minimal to no shame. There wouldn't be those whispers, did you see her face? What did she do this time? Why does she always attract those guys? Doesn't she know any better? She asked for it because she keeps going back. If I were bleeding from an open wound, there wouldn't be those judgments or the ridicule. There'd be help. For a long time, I was bleeding from wounds, internal and external ones, from abuse, from neglect, from domestic violence, from sexual assault, from trauma. I've got scars that I once covered with band-aids instead of the stitches that I needed. Folks used to ask me what's wrong with me and I'd get defensive and say, well, what's wrong with you? And one day someone asked me what had happened to me. And all the pain that I was holding onto began to be released. And I realized I didn't have to hold onto it anymore. No more shame and no more guilt. I've got a dollar in my pocket. I don't know where this dollar has been. It's not my first dollar and I sure hope it won't be my last. I've had crinkled dollars, I've had ripped dollars, I've had torn dollars, even a few shattered dollars. I've had neglected dollars and I know no matter what those dollars I've had have been through, no one rejects them or refuses them because of what they've been through. The value of those dollars don't change. And the value of those who have been impacted by trauma, abuse, neglect, or domestic violence don't change either. We are worth fighting for. We are worth being protected. We are worth being advocated for and not in silence. We are worthy of love and respect, worthy of kindness and compassion, worthy of others' understanding and less of others' biases, stereotypes, and ridicule. We are worthy to be praised, worthy to be forgiven, 
and worthy of forgiving ourselves. We are bold, brilliant, and beautiful. I've been impacted, knocked down, but not knocked out. I stand before you today, this evening, healing and unashamed. There are just two people I would really like to thank really quickly and I'll move out the way. But that person that asked me what had happened to me versus what's wrong with me is standing before you um, this evening. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, Jessica, I am doing so much better. I am so happy because you gave me the love and the support and the kindness I needed at a moment when I didn't know where else to turn. And the other person that I want to thank that's in this room this evening is the love of my life who has been there for me through thick and thin for 15 years, no matter what I put him through. I want to say I love you. Thank you so much for being by my side. I've needed you. Good night. Thank you, Desiree. That was awesome. Um, I'm Judith Crouch. I'm very proud to serve as the Chair of Board of Directors of Women's Support Services. And this is... Good evening. My name is Lieutenant Bill Baldwin. I'm the Commanding Officer of Troop B in North Canaan. And just before we get started, I just want to say that that was a very powerful poem, and I really appreciated that. And one of the things that struck me was a reluct reluctance to call the police. Uh, know that we are... The first, we could be the first line of defense for both victims and the accused, and we could be there to assist everybody that's involved in this, in this type of a situation, this type of a scourge. Our troopers are not only there to make an arrest and to enforce the law, but we're there to hold the hands of the victims of this uh, horrible scourge. And I want to just say that the partnership we have with Women's Support Services and Susan B. Anthony is a strong partnership that is beyond uh, our wildest dreams, anything that we could have had 20, 30 years ago. So again, I am very honored to be a part of this uh, event tonight. During the last year, in the state of Connecticut, 13 people lost their lives at the hands of their abusers. We gather tonight to take a stand against domestic violence and to making a difference in our communities. We will read the names of those who have lost their lives at this time. At the end of each name, we will say, we speak his, her name. Please respond by saying, we remember his, her name. Nasasha Lee Lee Hoy, 18, of Hartford, killed by her boyfriend with a firearm. We speak her name. We remember her name. Dennis Fitzsimons, 74, of Southbury, killed by his son with blunt force to the head and strangulation. We speak his name. We remember his name. His name. Charles Cristofalo, 76, of Bethel, killed by his brother-in-law with a firearm. We speak his name. We remember his name. Kathleen Stewart, 66, of New Milford, killed by her husband with a firearm. We speak her name. We remember her name. Dionysia Batista Cano, 24, of Stamford, killed by her husband by strangulation. We speak her name. We remember her name. Nadia Gonzalez, 26, of Bridgeport, killed by her daughter's father with a sharp object. We speak her name. We remember her name. Yashika Miles, 33, of New Britain, killed by her husband with a firearm. We speak her name. We remember her name. Phyllis Gervais, 79, of Torrington, killed by her husband with blunt force. We speak her name. We remember her name. Lisa Zemlock, 49, of Norwalk, killed by her live-in boyfriend with blunt force. We speak her name. We remember her name. Jennifer Knox, 33, of Bridgeport, killed by her husband who used a firearm and then took his own life. We speak her name. We remember her name. Shaquinaqui Brody, 29, 
of Waterbury, killed by her boyfriend with a firearm. We speak her name. My Jaya Richardson, nine of Waterbury, killed by her mother's boyfriend with a firearm. We speak her name. We remember her name. Soraya T. Henry, 30, of Hartford, killed by her boyfriend who used blunt force and strangulation. We speak her name. I'd like to introduce Jessica Troy, who's the family and child advocate at Women's Support Services. Tonight I will be reading a poem, Remember My Name, by Kimberly A. Collins. When you remember my walk upon this earth, look not into my steps with pity. When you taste the tears of my journey, notice how they fill my footprints, not my spirit, for that remains with me. My story must be told, must remain in conscious memory so my daughters won't cry my tears or follow my tortured legacy. Lovin' is a tricky thing. If it doesn't come from a healthy place, if lovin' doesn't first, practice on self, it will act like a stray bullet, not caring what it hits. You may say, maybe I should have loved him a little less. Maybe I shouldn't have not believed he'd never hit me again. All those maybes will not bring me back, not right his wrongs. My life was not his to take. As your eyes glance, my name understand once I breathed, walked, loved, just like you. <laughs> I wish for all who glance my name to know love turned fear, kept me there. Love twisted to fear, kept me in a chokehold, cut off my air, blurred my vision. I couldn't see how to break free. I should have told my family. I should have told my friends. I should have got the order of protection before the police let me, him go. But all those shoulda can't bring me back when I lied so well to cover the shame, to hide the signs. If my death had to show that what love isn't, if my death had to, had to show that love shouldn't hurt, if my death had to make sure another woman told a friend instead of holding it in, if my death reminds you how beautiful, how worthy you really are, if my death reminds you to honor all you are daily, then remember my name. Shout it from the center of your soul. Wake me in your grave. Let me know my living was not in vain. We will now take a moment of silence. to go too far. 